Good evening. At the outset, let me thank the members of Manthan for inviting me here and giving me this opportunity to share some thoughts, which will be based on the book I wrote. But the from that, I will try to link it to some issues which I feel are very pertinent today. So, first, what is this book about? It is uh, actually about the experiences of a young IAS officer posted in a very distant part of the country, which is the northeast. I was posted to Manipur, and this was in 1977. And uh, as I have been discovering from book discussions over the past two, three months, the knowledge and awareness of the northeast in the rest of the country has not improved much in the intervening 30 odd years. We seem to be more or less where we were when I joined the service, which is a quite a sad commentary on uh, the state of affairs. Now, this book, I mean, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I, I just want to make a few introductory remarks before I go on to my main subject, is uh, by reading this, will, one will not get a, say, a great understanding of the history, uh, geography, and flora, and fauna of Manipur. For that, you will have to probably read other books. This book is about the people of Manipur, and there again, it is not uh, a scholarly treatise on the ethnic diversity and the amazing, I, I would say almost bewildering diversity of that small state, but it is about uh, it is an anecdotal account of uh, small people, like the driver in the SDO's office and the head clerk and the office superintendent and the deputy commissioner and other. And through their stories, what I hope the reader will get is a sense of understanding what are the issues which they are bothered about. And it should come as no surprise that they are bothered about the issues which we are bothered about. You know. They want a good education for their children. They want security. They want their, and the young people want good jobs. They want livelihoods. They want secure futures, etc. I used an anecdotal style because since I was writing about this region more than 30 years after working there, and since a lot has happened in that region in the intervening period. You know, as Wittgenstein said, one of the most difficult thing is to how to keep the knowledge of subsequent events from influencing the narrative of a previous of a certain time. So, it, you know, it, then it would be very easy for me to come through as a person who seemed to know everything, what was going to happen and what was the bad decision because of the benefit of hindsight. So, by adopting an anecdotal style, I have tried to avoid that. I do not know to what extent I have succeeded. In this book, and uh, since writing this book, I have got interest, I have started getting interested again in the issues of the Northeast as a region and Manipur as a specific state. Now, one may wonder, so what is the significance to the rest of the country, uh, people like us in the very distant, uh, you know, about a very distant part of this country? What is the significance of anything learned there? It, would it not be something very particular and specific to the Northeast? I will try over the next few minutes to show you that actually what is going on there is a it is something like a microcosm of the rest of the country. And if we are able to deal with, if we are able to help to solve some of the problems of the Northeast and Manipur, we would have taken a major step forward in our understanding of how societies can function with tremendous diversity within those societies. How do you try to reconcile 
you know, apparently contradictory and conflicting interests. So the first, there are three issues which I feel uh, are pertinent and which I try to bring out in this narrative. The first is the issue of identity. An identity based, identity can be based on so many things, isn't it? It can be based on gender, can be based on caste, can be based on community, can be based on ethnic factors, etc. Now, identity is rearing its head as must be evident to all of us today as an increasingly as a driver of political activity today. And it it is possibly coinciding with the diminishing role for ideology. So, as ideology retreats, its place has to be taken by something and a kind of an unthinking response where you can just reach out and is always available is identity. And that seems to be now increasingly animating political discourse, articulating these kind of um, issues rising out of identity. And in this context, it is interesting to uh, you know, look back 67 years ago in, in 1947 when this country was stitched together out of more than 600 nominally independent principalities, princely states, protectorates, British administered territories, etc. It is a mosaic. You know. Out of this kind of patchwork quilt was born this country in 1947 through the sort of silent behind the scenes work of Sardar Patel, V. P. Menon and a few others. And one fine day, lo and behold, here was this giant complex country. At that time, think tanks in London, Washington, Moscow, Peking, it was Peking those days, Tokyo, etc., studied the matter and came to the scholarly and what at that time appeared to be very reasonable conclusion that this country is not likely to survive in this form. In fact, there was an influential paper in a, uh, within a think tank in Peking which advised the Chinese government that you need not do anything much to worry about or to disturb India, just leave them alone and they will not survive beyond 1970 as a country, as a functioning entity. And this was a similar conclusion which was arrived at in Moscow, Washington, London, and all the world capitals, because everybody was speculating about this, this, you know, this huge new creation. The other big country which became independent around the same time was China, which had a completely different form of governance. And not only was this very complex, diverse country uh, sort of doomed their breaking up. They had, this country had also made the mistake in inverted commerce of opting for a parliamentary system of government, for a federal polity, and they said, good God. And then by early 50s, when the states were reorganized on linguistic basis, uh, it was felt that the, the gloomiest forecasts of all the pundits were going to be proved right. But what has happened in the intervening 67 years? There is no USSR today. There is no Yugoslavia today. These countries have just blown apart, not imploded, they have exploded. And some of them are seeing fratricidal, uh, you know, butchery and massacre of a kind which could not, which many Europeans could not imagine. Though actually they need not go too far back in the history to see other examples of such things. But the point was, here were countries like the USSR and uh, Yugoslavia, which were under very strong central administration, which exploded, isn't it, or imploded. And during this time, this country, which pundits have, did not give any prospects to survive in its in, I mean, you know, survive intact beyond 1970, in 2014 is not only a functioning entity, is one of the strong growing economies in the world, where a 5 percent rate of growth of GDP is considered to be a slowdown and a crisis and all that. 
and uh, it is considered to be you know one of the strong emerging markets um, a much coveted uh, you know business destination investment destination etc i don't think there has been enough reflection um, or analysis within our country among us as individuals we seem to have taken it for granted that this country will survive but just try and see it from a outsider's perspective it's actually a remarkable achievement and why it has survived what is the glue that is keeping this country together is something which i i i you know i don't think i i have the answer i think it is something which really needs to be studied possibly i i uh, i feel a clue lies in nasim taleb's latest book anti fragile where he talks about this quality which he defines as anti fragility which is as equips systems organisms organizations and even nations to withstand external shocks far better than very strongly centrally administered and run systems on the question of identity it's also interesting to speculate about how recent a phenomenon this issue of identity is actually 60000 years ago a group of human beings walked out of the great rift valley in africa all looking the same all with the same gene pool and they trudged up crossed over the land bridge into asia turn right and then they walked along mesopotamia and uh, you know the tigris valley and all that some of them came into the into india what is now india and flourished and thrived and another and went to europe 60000 years ago and then all these differences came about as they adapted and as they lived in different regions and you know ate different kind of food faced different climatic conditions etc and there some grew tall and strong and some grew dark and some went pale and some had curly hair and all that and now this issue of identity which we think is a issue worth going to war about worth you know fighting with your neighbors about etc and identity has moved from appearance and physiognomy and color and all that to beliefs diet etc clothes flags and all sorts of things so identity has become a very you know it so it's a little amusing to speculate back on uh, the what is the scientific or uh, you know whatever basis logical basis is there for this identity the second issue is migration and as i mentioned here you know migration is i think uh, we uh, I, you know as human beings we are migrants so the first migration was out of the great rift valley and then we've been migrating all over the place so now when we, when we, when we hear this talk of sons of the soil you no know, who who are the sons of the soil anywhere you know i mean it raises a question about you know okay i came here first that's all you can say isn't it you can't say that this piece of land is mine in what sense i came here first that's all so this migration is going on all the time and the, the, you know the most recent case a large scale migration i think would be the united states of america it's only you know 200 years ago that they pilgrim fathers and all first landed on the east coast and from there the it it became a bigger and bigger flood and now look at that so that's the most recent example of colonization on a big scale migration on a huge scale but migration is going on all the time <coughs> and migration is usually driven by you know search for living room you know lebensraum it's you know it's a it's a quest for survival it's a drive to find a place to you know drop roots and grow and uh, survive isn't it in other words it's economic factors which drive this migration that's been happening throughout now i mentioned this migration here because when we in the context of the northeast and uh, 
Manipur about which I wrote. Migration has played a big role in creating some of the problems, laying the seeds of some of the problems which have now they have those seeds have grown into shrubs and trees and all that and they have seen as very, very big serious problem. The, if we do, if we read the history of the independence movement, most of it is, you know, Delhi centric and at the same time and we deal with the west, the western part. There is hardly too much discussion about what happened in the east, especially undivided Bengal and uh, uh, the issues connected with that. So, I was reading recently Sanjay Hazarika's wonderful book, Strangers in the Mist, written in 94, where he, he, of course, he writes in a journalistic fashion, but it's all very authentic in terms of, you know, you can look up the footnotes and go to the uh, bibliography and see all that work, but it's a very uh, readable work. And Sanjay Hazarika brings out very powerfully the, the factors which have led to a lot of uh, suspicion and um, uh, I would say distrust, mistrust of government which has come in the northeast. The, uh, from his account, it appears that at the time when it appeared that to the Congress party and the leaders of the freedom struggle that partition was inevitable, that was a kind of deal which was struck with the Muslim League, between the Muslim League and the Congress party. Then it was a question of apparently jockeying for seeing what is the maximum territory which can be, you know, which can go to Pakistan and which will come to, which will remain with India. So, while there was less of an issue in the west, there was quite an issue in the east, because in undivided Bengal, the Assam and the northeast was a kind of a, like an afterthought, the issue mainly about undivided Bengal. And um, so, when there were apprehensions among the Assamese and the people of that part that they were likely to be included with Pakistan, Gopinath, Gopinath Bordoloi took up this matter very strenuously with the Congress, uh, you know, the higher uh, bodies within the Congress. And apparently, his uh, apprehensions were dismissively treated by even people like Pandit Nehru and Sadar Patel and Abdul Kalam Azad and others. Because they, and they felt that they were so close to striking a deal, it was almost a deal, because only once the deal was struck could, uh, you know, and partition was de facto, uh, I mean, you know, it, if, it, if it was a reality, that independence would come. So, this whole thing they felt was being held up by this pesky guy, Gopinath Bordoloi, keeping on insisting about some region about which nobody knew much about it, in case, that was Assam and the Northeast. I think uh, <coughs> today, when if I, you know, if justice has to be done, I think probably he should be the guy who should be, you know, when, while giant sculptures are being erected to or planned to be erected to various, in the, in the memory of various great leaders, I think somebody should put up a huge statue for Gopinath Bordoloi for having ensured that the Northeast remains with India, because it is single, he is easily, he is the person who should be given credit for this. Otherwise, it would have gone to Pakistan. It was, uh, I mean, it's, no, it was not, not that it was a done deal, it would have happened by default, because that is the, because of the fact that the central leadership did not consider that a very important part of the country or the, you know, the new country which would emerge and that they felt that this technicality, this irritating kind of, uh, you know, thing was holding up the whole deal. So, it was something like, you know, why are we bothering about this? So, I think we must try to understand the context and otherwise we will think how can such wise and people of such great sagacity have made such a mistake at that, but that was apparently what. So, the second issue is this thing about migration and that migration comes in there because what um, Hazarika points out is one of the <coughs> uh, plots or the strategy which was being used by the Muslim League at that time and there was a, a gentleman who was the, I think the governor of undivided Bengal was Sadullah was to uh, 
you know, uh, move a large population from certain parts of uh, Bengal into certain parts of Assam, so that when the final um, survey was done, this would also be reckoned and taken as part of Pakistan. But thanks to Bordelois uh, uh, foreseeing this and uh, forestalling this, uh, that did not come to pass and we know what happened after that. But the point is, this rankled in the minds of the, it was remained in the minds of the Assamese who were uh, worried about this uh, fact of migration. And when this happened later, because uh, you know of the time which I write is 1978, 79, 80. That was the time I joined the service. 77 was the year I joined the service and 77 is a landmark year, not because I joined the service, but because that was the first non-Congress government which, since independence. And uh, 78 and 79 are important because that was the time when the revision of the roles was attempted in the in most parts of the country for, as a preparation for the general elections. But which had particular significance in the northeast because what we encountered as very junior district officials, we were electoral registration officers and we had to carry out these quasi judicial proceedings which are uh, where uh, you know people whose names have been omitted will claim that their name should be included and it is a quasi judicial proceeding where people can object, objections have to be heard and finally a decision has to be taken as to whether a person should be included or not. We noticed that for instance I was serving in Manipur that there were a large number of people who were obviously of Nepalese origin in certain pockets who were applying for inclusion in the electoral rolls. They had the necessary documents which was a house tax receipt and a ration card. I mean beyond that there were no other real documents of citizenship at that time. In fact, I remember when I asked one chap, um, you know, how do you prove that you are, I mean, can you prove that you are an Indian citizen? He asked me back. He said, sir, can you prove that you are an Indian citizen? You know, he said, you would also uh, give a tax receipt and a ration card. I have both. So, why can't you accept these two? So, that was a kind of a, a you know, it was a real issue for us because strictly following the rules, we had to accept the claim. But ag against that was the fact that the local panchayat representatives and others who were there who know that area were saying that these guys are not from that area. And they also contended that they were not Indian citizens. They were not citizens and therefore they should not be included. Now in Manipur it was a relatively smaller issue because this was in some few pockets. But my colleagues who were in Assam, they were reporting that this was not in a few dozens or hundreds, it was in thousands. And they said that, they, and I am sure under some right to information act if somebody files a petition and asks for the, uh, these electoral registration officers reports. It will make very interesting reading today in the, in the light of what happened subsequently. Because we must remember at that time, it was at that time that the you know, All Assam Students Union was formed. The All Assam Students Union agitation was something which, you know, initially it was very dismissively treated. People said some students agitation, you know, what is the big deal? Now, we know what a big deal it was because ASU came like a tsunami, isn't it? After that, it just swept off uh, the, the then elected governments and they formed a government, AGP etc. and all the rest is history. So, that students movement came out of, it was a spontaneous thing which arose all over Assam. And there are these reports by young, my, you know, my, uh, my batchmates as young colleagues, young officers, 25, 26 year old people who were writing that there is a problem for us and we want guidance from the, from the state secretariat or from the election commissioner or from the election commission. And, or, and from the government of India as to what to do here because there is something at work. It seemed systematic, it seemed on a large scale, so uh, there could be consequences. That was what we were trying to report. It was ignored, it was literally laughed out of the room as uh, you know, young guys who do not know what they are talking about, who have no experience, we have seen this all before, do not worry, go ahead and the rest as they say is history. Now, to complete the cycle, so the first is identity and then you have migration is governance, how you know, dealing with these issues of identity and uh, which has been complicated by the fact of migration, you know, how do we respond to this? So, at uh, my experience in government has is restricted to the 
district administration level because I uh, served for only very few years. Most of that service was in district administration. And um, my uh, feeling is that the problems of governance in this country and a lot of the solutions lie at the district administration level. In fact, I would hazard a, an opinion that uh, you know the earlier uh, puzzle which I mentioned about how did this large complex and highly diverse country stay together as a country for 60 you know these all these years despite the various centrifugal forces which were at work and with help from some external sources and many without any help from external sources. So, despite all these um, uh, adverse factors at work, why, what was the glue, how did this country stay together? One of the uh, areas which we should look to, you know, if we want to look at some practical things, uh, is the district administration. Because uh, in, uh, in about 600, I think at last count we have 640 districts. Districts are being, you know, like amoeba, they keep multiplying and breaking up and all. But I think there are about 640 districts in the country. And what is amazing is the fact that in these districts, regardless of whether it is Ukrul in on the Burma border or say Kanyakumari district in the south or a district in uh, Junagad or district in Kashmir, the district gov administration structure, the district governance structure is almost identical everywhere. And that is actually a remarkable fact which we, which passes unnoticed most of the time. That is in the district, you have all the elements which are necessary to continue the quotidian tasks of government, daily work of governance where the citizen is concerned without any need to refer back to a secretariat or anything. The district uh, education officer, the district medical officer, the district health, and uh, the, the district magistrate, the district police officer, many of them draw their powers from enactments and statutes which are original powers. They, these are not powers given to them by a state government or anything. So, in other words, a structure has been created which can function something like the autonomous nervous system of the human body. So, regardless of the various storms in teacups which happen in state capitals and even in the national capital, life goes on in the district. Have not we noticed that as a phenomenon? So, you know all kinds of buns and big um, throwing chapels and throwing mics and <laughs> throwing up everything which is throwable in, inside uh, legislative assemblies and things like that. Life goes on in the district. Uh, uh, in a in a in a kind of very ordinary you know in a very normal routine way. If it wasn't for that, I think for such a huge complex country, it would it would be simply impossible for it to have worked. That district administration is now gradually being uh, weakened, and there are cases of it coming. We may think that uh, it's not you know uh, I mean in case we think that it has been completely uh, what shall I say. Uh, made ineffective, that is not true, but it is being gradually weakened by political appointments, by uh, frequent transfers, by uh, lack of fixity of tenure, where the SP is there for 6 months or 1 month and then he is transferred out and the same happens for district magistrates, etc. So, I think what the, if, if I were to propose an administrative reform uh, to, to help stem the rot, if not solve the problem. One of the things I would do is bring fixity of tenure to district officials. That is, if they are posted in a district, unless there is, they have committed some criminal act or, uh, you know, there is some very strong compelling reason, they should be kept in that position for, say, two years or three years, something like that. Because the district administration, the way it has worked from, um, uh, and the way I have seen it work, and I believe it will be the experience of most of us if we really think about it, has been one of the keys to explaining this this kind of this uh, conundrum or this amazing this paradox of how this country has continued to uh, you know continue to function so this completes this kind of triangle of uh, identity uh, migration which are two uh, which are very closely related and governance being the base of this at the at the district level and i feel that today 
we really are facing a, a may, I mean, a, a kind of decision time. It has come to us because 67 years. The good news is we have, as a country, survived for 67 years. But I think the uh, the the you know probably things are beginning to fray at the edges, uh, and you know like uh, in in some of these systems when um, when collapse comes, it's like that. Uh, you know the frog being being placed in uh, warm water and the water is gradually being heated and by when the, by the time it becomes aware that there's a problem it is already too uh, too comfortable and too lazy and the water is too hot for it to get out anyway so the collapse of such systems when it comes can be very sudden can be cataclysmic you know this is uh, gladwell and others have spoken about this that there is a tipping point when when uh, you know it's like environment it's like a climate also you know it doesn't happen very gradually it can happen pretty uh, you know catastrophically so i I'm, i don't want to sort of uh, put in some kind of uh, you know sound like a prophet of doom or anything but i feel we should take all these little signs as the signs that the water is warming up and uh, we shouldn't get too comfortable saying that anyway we survived for 67 years so we're going to survive for another 67 years without any problems and so I see, I think there is, a, uh, I think the citizens with the, with the basic innate good common sense of citizens are also sensing this and that is expressing itself in their activism in politics, etc., which is finding expression in things like the Ahmad Me Party and various other things. I am not getting into the details about what their economic policies are and what their views are on various subjects, but the very fact that um, they are able uh, such challenges to the existing political system are finally emerging after so many years is a good sign that uh, some thinking is beginning to happen on the subject so i feel that we are today in a situation where we need to start thinking about this issue of identity and so circling back to where i started which is the northeast and i will end with that is that in the northeast say in, a, in if you take manipur it's a small state Two and a half million with an area of about 16,000 square kilometers. But look at the population, only two and a half million. That two and a half million, 67 percent of that is Maite, the people of the valley, who have 30 percent of the land, who live on 30 percent of the land, and 37 percent who are the hill tribes divided among Naga, Mizo, Kuki, Paite, and various others, live on 67 percent of the land. And there are severe restrictions on land ownership and land transferability, etc., with all with good intentions to protect the interests of the hill people, etc. So, in this very complex little place, I think you find a microcosm of India. And earlier today, I was at, I was talking to a bunch of students at the University of Hyderabad, and there were a large cohort from the northeast who were asking, you know, you can sense the anger and and uh, uh, you know frustration in their voices and in the kind of questions which they were. So while they were very rightly criticizing the government of India for many things, I asked them finally, I felt that I needed to put the responsibility also back on them. So I said, see, let us assume that with a wand of, wave of a wand, you wish away the, the armed forces all go away, the, the obnoxious armed forces special powers act is repealed and you know it is a thing of the past, all this is solved. I said, will your problems be over? Won't you people be at each other's throats? Won't the Paite be at the Kuki's throat and the Kuki on the Naga and the, within the Naga you have the Tangkul and Zaili and uh, you know Ao and Angami and so many others and none of you can see eye to eye. There are sort of very, very strong divide between these uh, various tribes there. They have not worked out. See, just like in the rest of India, in, in, a, in a district, you know, I mean, I remember as a as a young district official, my friends used to say, if we get a report of a fight going on in the bazaar, the question we will ask is, who are the combatants? If it is if it is uh, Sham and Shiv, no problem. If it is Sham and Muhammad, then all the antennas are uh, alert. That's you, you become sensitive to this, isn't it? In the northeast, we had the same issue. So we will be told there is some brawl going on in the main street in the village or in the town. So, for, first question we will say, are they from the same tribe? If they are from the same tribe, we will say, we will go back to work. It will be somebody will sort it out. 
If they are not from the same tribe, we will say, all right, everybody gets, you know, short of calling out the fire brigade, we call out everybody else because something is going to happen. So, how do we uh, find a way, a common platform on for diverse, people of diverse backgrounds, faiths, uh, you know, uh, caste, community, creed, etc., to work together? I do not think any longer we can say that there is some way we will find it, you know, I think we have to devote some thought, because how we have come for 67 years so far without any catastrophic problem happening and though there have been very, very, uh, you know, terrible, um, uh, you know, episodes which have happened in all these years, we cannot leave it to some supernatural powers that uh, uh, no terrible thing will happen. We need to really figure out a way and the interesting thing is within Manipur, there are some very, uh, you know, very highly, I mean, very brilliant minds, young people who are thinking about the subject and we need to also help them by putting our best uh, resources in terms of people, brains, everything into this because if we are able to find some solutions in Manipur and if they work there, we will be able to try them on a much larger scale in the rest of the country. I will just end with this saying that let us not imagine that these are problems which are very distant. You know. See the problem of migration for instance. I was talking to a group in Trivandrum and everybody was sitting back and you know I, I felt there was a certain sense of complacency among them, you know, that this is all problems of some place which is about 4000 kilometers away. So, how could it, while well, um, it is very unfortunate that those problems are there, nevertheless how does it really concern us? I reminded the group there that in an article in a, in a leading Malayalam daily, a report had come that 10 percent of the population of Kerala was accounted for by migrant workers. Now, 10 percent of 33 million is quite a lot, 3.3 3 million people from of the total population of Kerala are people who are not from Kerala, who have migrated there for work. Now, that is interesting, I just on a humorous uh, sidelight is Kerala prides itself on this hard working Malayalis working in the Gulf and sending home the money orders, is not it? Supposed to be the money order economy, is not it? Everybody waits for the money order to come. But um, out of the 75,000 crores which is supposed to come into Kerala, I did a back of the envelope calculation and applied a statutory minimum wage and discovered that 45,000 crores is flowing out to eastern India, which is good. I think that sort of binds the country together in a sense. But I, I, I the, on a more serious note, what I tried to tell that group was, see in Kerala, the electric is so finely balanced that a majority of 5,000 in a parliamentary election is considered a thumping majority. Barring one district in that state, which is Malapuram district, where you have majorities of 50,000, etc., in uh, no other place do you, so 5,000. Now, imagine if 3.5 million people who are not from that state get included in the electoral rolls of that state, what a, it, I think it will be like a tsunami, the <laughs> effect on Kerala politics will be something which uh, cannot be even, you know, which people cannot foresee. So, it is not something like, you know, it is something very far away. Similarly, uh, I was talking in a uh, few days ago in Bangalore and again I felt something I had to do to, to make people look less relaxed, <laughs> you know. In the, so, I said, see this thing about identity we think is very unfortunate, these people in the northeast, why can't they live with each other, what is the problem, why are they, why, why do they not, uh, you know, have more fraternal feelings. I said, my friends, if the water level in the Krishna Raja Saga dam falls by 10 feet and if your car is, has the wrong registration number and you are on the wrong side of the Kerala, I mean of the Karnataka Tamil Nadu border, you are in trouble. Two, two people, in fact two, you can say cultures which are very, which can claim a very proud past, the water level in the dam determines how they behave on a particular. So then, so where is this, so what I am trying to say is identity has this very dangerous uh, uh, capacity to escalate what, what should be very small problem, I mean not small, serious problems, but which should be resolved in civilized discourse across the table 
makes people reach for uh, cycle chains and uh, bombs and this and that, isn't it? So, let us not underestimate it, let us not think that it is very far away uh, to use a very dramatic thing, let us use, use the words of John Don and say, ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so very much. That was very nice. But we have already have a solution to the problem. Let there be a thousand manthans across the country. Absolutely. The whole idea of manthan is to provide a platform for civil discourse, for solving problems by talking to people, each other. And that's the whole, what it is all about. Well, friends, uh, this is all between you and him. And here we go, who will carry the mic? Good evening. I just have a question. What uh, did you actually do when uh, you were faced with the problem of Nepalis being a part of electoral uh, <coughs> roles and what do you actually do there? That's it. In, that, uh, in that specific instance, I included them in the electoral roles <laughs> because I, I reported that there is this issue, but the documents being produced are, you know, are legally valid documents. And so there was nothing, I mean, uh, we are, uh, for, uh, we have to follow certain process and that is uh, the, I think the sine qua non for, uh, for government is that you have to follow the prescribed procedure. So we followed the process, we uh, looked at the evidence and what we were reporting up was, see, if it was a stray case or something like it, it would not have mattered. We were saying that there seems to be, uh, it's, uh, there seems to be, it seems to be organized, that is what we were worried about, though we did not have any evidence about it because that is what the local people were alleging. But I know what I did was I included them in the electoral world. Hello. Sir, I am told that there are hundreds of uh, underground outfits in work, in, op in operation at uh, this time. Number two is uh, they are anti-Hindi, the, if you, they do not screen Hindi movies over there. Or uh, most of the anti-Hindi, anti-India uh, sentiment is there. How do we solve this problem? When hundreds are missing, many are not recognized, men are not been identified, is it political? This is part one. Part two is, is, are the problems similar to that of Kashmir and the Northeast? Are the same or something different? <coughs> I will answer the second part first, that is about Kashmir and Northeast. Um, I think the problems in the Northeast are much more complex because of the there are many more identities involved there rather than a simple, you know, it is a, in Kashmir it is one major issue. So, uh, uh, that is one big difference and therefore, the thing is that I do not think there is a, uh, even to get a grasp of the problem, uh, like in, um, uh, in, you know, in the discussion earlier today, uh, I found uh, that the, uh, the students from Manipur, Nagaland, etc. They were even objecting to being lumped together as northeast. They said, no, no, there is no such thing. This is just a geographical entity. It is a directional uh, phrase. It's just northeast is a direction. Uh, there is no such place called the northeast of India and all that. There is either Manipur, Nagaland, Mizoram, etc. So the problems are complex because of, uh, I mean, the, the complexity is much greater there. And it's interesting this uh, this comparison which you made because a few days ago, I wrote a article in the uh, in the business line where i compared kashmir and the northeast and i wondered about this why this uh, you know while we should give importance to kashmir why this neglect of the northeast and i compared the two i took this you know in uh, in our uh, our policy is to show the old undivided kashmir you know where aksai chin and azad kashmir everything is shown as uh, kashmir the area of this undivided kashmir is about 220000 square kilometers its population is 15 million. The area of the northeast is more than 200, and, uh, it's around 260,000 square kilometers. The population is 30 million. Now that's not the real difference. The difference is now if, if you start looking at look at the neighborhoods, the neighborhood around Kashmir, states which are being declared as failed states, with the perpetual insurrections and insurgencies going on, with the terrorism at work 
whether it is Pakistan, Afghanistan, Tajikistan and all these other places. In short, not a very nice neighborhood. <laughs> and you look at uh, the neighborhood of uh, the, the northeast. If you put a center at uh, Gohati and draw a, a, you know, a circle with a radius of about 1500 kilometers, you will be including some of the fastest growing regions in the world in that. And where there is a very strong motivation for China and India to come together and in fact bury the differences to see that that part opens up. Because unless both shake hands, they are not going to be able to build the railroads, the highways, etc., which connect them. Today, unfortunately, I, I, you know, I am not too sure, but the last sentence in my article was, I said, see, we need to have a policy which does not think that by improving the roads on our borders, we are going to make it easier for Chinese troops to come into India. I mean, if we have that kind of thinking, I mean, do the Chinese need our roads to come in? I think with this heavy lift capacity, etc., which is today available, they do not need the roads. You know? So, I, I think this is antediluvian kind of uh, thinking. You know, we are fighting um, some battles of the past. And we should just look at what are the uh, things. So, the neighborhoods, if you look at, then look at the, uh, the natural resources. In the, compare Kashmir, the natural resource of Kashmir with the, with the natural resource of the Northeast. So, there is a huge uh, thing, uh, you know, uh, big thing, which at least that the Northeast merits more importance, if not at least the equal importance, which we give to Kashmir in terms of the attention and the even media space and every other thing. Your first question, I. Yeah. Second, second part is the anti-India sentiment. Ah, the anti-India sentiment. And as a matter of fact, sir, in our Janaganamana national anthem, there is no mention of North East states, sir. So, it, Banga uh, is everything. So, so, you know, as I mentioned, this uh, in Sanjay Hazarika's book, the, he brings out that some of the greatest national leaders, you know, people whom we revere as people who are the builders of the country, they felt Gopinath Bordoloi was wasting their time about an irrelevant matter, about an un, not irrelevant, about an unimportant matter, about some place which he is talking about when they were almost shaking hands with Jinnah and they almost had a deal. So, that is how important the Northeast was for the, uh, you know, the, for the founding fathers of this nation. So, the, it, it has never got any importance. Now, uh, you know, to, uh, to answer your question about the feelings of the people there. Uh, I think the sad fact is the uh, the feelings of a lot of the people are uh, you know are what you said they are, and um, you know I was re uh, re you know recently reading some books which have been written to bring myself up to date about what is the condition there today, because I, I have written about the late 70s and ending with 1980. At that time, I assure you, of course there are you know incidents like uh, I, I narrate one incident here where I am driving back after a tour and my driver Rajan Singh was a Maite. We were talking about this and that and he was describing some wedding which he attended of a Marwari businessman in Imphal. He attended that wedding and he was describing a very exaggerated account he gave of all the money and the gold and all that. He loved all those details. He was an incessant, you know, he used to keep me informed about all the happenings in that place. So finally he turns to me conversationally and says, sir, in India, how uh, something, something, it just, it, it came, it comes naturally. And, uh, and I felt suddenly very lonely, you know, here I am a very young guy and this guy is asking me in India, how are things, you know. So, even at that time, there was this feeling of alienation, but, uh, and uh, they, the Manipuris had in Maite, they had a, a term for us outsiders, which was Mayang, which was not apparent, I understand was not a complimentary term. So. So, you would not uh, address a friend as a Mayang. So, it was there then. Apparently, it has got much worse since then. The, 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 uh, during the time of which I have written, the army was used in operations in Manipur. Most of the uh, counter insurgency operations and law and order operations were handled by the local police with support where needed when anti insurgency operations had to be done by the Central Reserve Police Force, CRPF. After uh, 1980, apparently, and of, of that region, I do not have direct knowledge. Um, some people, I think, some, I mean, I am sure for, with the best of intentions and on the basis of some evidence in, who are in North Block, decided that to send in a whole mountain division. Now, 
I mean, I, you know, one of my batchmates wrote to me saying the vehicular population of Imphal has doubled because at that time when a, when a mountain division moves in, you can imagine how many vehicles. They said these are absolutely the streets were clogged with military vehicles. So it was like, uh, you know, it was like as though the Chinese had decided to come in or something. It seemed to be a grossly disproportionate response to a problem. Now I am in no position to, uh, uh, to so, so then and then came the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. Now that was not in force at the time when I was there, it was not being used. And um, from what I have read about it and, uh, and when you see the heroic uh, struggle of Iram Sharmila and you know, she's, a, it's an ama she's an amazing person. If you see all that, see the most disturbing thing about the Armed Forces um, Special Powers Act is there is a clause there which says, no officer acting under the provisions of this act will be held to account or can be uh, any decision can be questioned later in any inquiry or disciplinary proceeding. Now, if you give that kind of uh, uh, carte blanche to, I think even the most upright officer uh, will find it very hard to, you know, restrain, if not himself, at least his men, isn't it, from taking some severe action. And uh, I think that has led to this kind of uh, very strong feeling of, uh, not alienation is a mild word for it today. So, I will also say what I would suggest, I, I you know, at the, at a discussion in Delhi, where a lot of retired people, this was at the Delhi Gymkhana club, their book club had invited me for a similar talk, and there were, I could see in the audience, there were people who are obviously retired generals, even that person, a person like me could make out that person, the way, the, the carriage and the upright walk and all that. And then some retired civilians also were there. So I proposed something. I thought, you know, anyway, they are not going to beat me up because they seem to be a fairly friendly lot. So I said, what will happen if we repeal the armed forces special power unilaterally? I said, see, the government is the immeasurably stronger protagonist compared to the other side. The other side, they are all small outfits, very small outfits. And frankly, today, very few of them are getting any support from China and all. China is playing the India card very carefully now. You know, it's a very different kind of ball game, not from some adventurous times in the past. Now. So they are hard, they are finding it, they are finding themselves hard pressed to get any ammunition, etc. They are up against the, among the most highly trained armed forces in the world. It's the, pro, there's complete asymmetry in the relationship. The armed forces are too powerful. Okay. So I said, the, isn't it uh, the duty of the stronger party to make the concessions? Because you can always withdraw them later if it does not work. So I said, supposing you repeal, unilaterally repeal the Armed Forces Special Powers Act and withdraw the army into the cantonments, I ask the audience a rhetorical question, what will happen? What is the worst which can happen? And I am gratified to say that there was silence actually. I mean, it, I think they were all thinking, but the point was, it was there was no ready answer like, oh, the whole place will go up in flames, China will walk in. No, nobody said anything of the kind. So people are thinking. So I think we need to do some, you know, we need some uh, some maverick there to uh, ask this question. You know, what will happen if we do it? I have a first a comment to make. I think you are wrong, sir, when you said that the largest migration happened in the United States. In modern history, the largest migration happened in Gachibauli, close by. Uh, I, I stand corrected. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, I, in regarding identity, I think uh, I take your point. It is a very good insight you have given that uh, it is a discrete administration, which is a commonality across the country. Uh, I think also elections is an identity and the same election process throughout the country keeps us together. I want you to react to that. Last thing is that I want you to react to this different time zone which the Manipuris have, and which the Northeast has been demanding. And I think it's a fair uh, thing that we have to do it because otherwise there is uh, there are a lot of consequences which they have to face. Yeah. And uh, our sense of identity with them is not there because they have to change their entire lifestyles yeah. so that they can be with us. I want you to react to that. So the first point about uh, district administration, I agree. I think, uh, you know, we, that deserves a lot more uh, study and lot more, uh, uh, I think, analysis and uh, 
some thought into how can we strengthen that. I have some ideas on that and I am sure anybody who thinks about it. See, today what we do is we send very young officers there, which is good. But I think we should increase the district administration tenure, I mean the total period of service out of the total say 35 years of service of an of a officer, less than f uh, 6 to 8 years is being spent in the field these days. And then the rest of the time you are in the secretariat or in running various public sector bodies and all. I think this should be increased to about half the time. And uh, there should be uh, for you know an opportunity for people after they go to the secretariat and get certain experience then they come back as reasonably senior people and be posted back into the districts as district collectors and other things and various other functional heads that will be one. What is the second point which? Yeah, so the second is election. I, you know, election not just as a, uh, as the common process, but, um, you know, I have been part of the, uh, I, I, uh, I write about the election process here. In fact, I had the, uh, I must say, I can't say good fortune, I had the misfortune of being a returning officer for 14 assembly constituencies simultaneously. I think I should enter the Guinness Book of Records for that because I sent, I remember we had to send a report after that where I um, uh, opposed this practice of making a person returning officer for more than one constituency because actually the, if you see the returning officer's handbook is a book this thick. It is a, you know, in fact, I think the person. Uh, probably Atul Gawande wrote his checklist manifesto after reading the returning officer's handbook. You know. Because it is such a marvelous book, you just have to follow that, you can conduct an election. It is, it takes care of almost every uh, situation. But the, I think the, uh, the, you know, so the, if you are returning officer for 14 constituencies, it is not uh, the degree of difficulty multiplied 14 times, it is raised to the power of 14, you know, in the sense that See, because anything goes wrong means you are opening grounds for an election petition. And then after God help you, if you found that you have not signed some form or you forgot some, some uh, you know, some particular process, stage in a process, and because of that, if an election is set aside by the high court, then it is a, it's a black mark against an officer. So, I, I, you know, I mentioned that. So, the election process, the common election process definitely is a unifying factor, and particularly the fact that it happens so smoothly. See, I, I, you know, like many things in this country, I think when good things happen, when something really works, we take it for granted. See, look at the elections in the United States of America. It is an absolutely messy process compared to what we do here. And in this huge, complex country with massive logistical problems, the elections go off just like a, you know, and even uh, those uh, few sort of gubber thing like booth capturing and all that which used to happen is uh, shrinking and there is not to very few places in the country. So, the fact that this happens so smoothly and I think what unifies them, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the unifying effect of the election process is that it is not run by a cadre of people, school teachers, uh, district rationing officers, taluk supply officers, you are any arm of government, you are conscripted, you are served the, this thing and that is it. You, then after that you can forget about your private life till the election is over. You know. But the, that drill, that discipline is a tremendous thing and it works, it works. It is like the census of India, the decennial census again is another massive wonderful operation which I had the privilege of being, you know, in my short service career, I could uh, participate in that also. So, these processes are the, uh, I mean, are, I, I, I mean, I agree that they are also unifying factors. What was the third point? Time, time zone. Time zone, you are absolutely, the, actually the most disorienting thing for a guy like me from you land when I went to Arunachal Pradesh for my army attachment. I couldn't believe it. Uh, my watch showed 3:30, and the 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 army one tunnel in which we were going had to have its headlights on to to see our way. In that place, Hailiang, Teju, and Hailiang, the easting, the line of longitude which passes through Hailiang passes through Thailand, and Thailand is I think two hours ahead of us. So the uh, I think the British in the old days, the tea uh, uh, and the Dig Boy oil refinery and all I used to have a, they used to advance, they had a thing called Assam tea time or some, you know, maybe an unofficial arrangement, uh, which was one hour in advance of Indian standard time. I mean, the, the time which was followed in Delhi. I think there is uh, probably a strong case for 
two time zones in India and not one through Delhi, one should go through the western part and the other should probably go through covering from Calcutta onwards and that would make much more sense. Otherwise, I remember many times we wake up, it is 5 a.m., it is bright daylight and then we sit because of, you know, government offices start only at 10, which means by 10.30. Half the day has gone and you still have not got out of your house. And uh, so, I think this daylight, it is a waste of daylight hours is a huge thing and probably the economically itself, it, it is likely to have great consequences. So, I am all for having more but, time but zone. But not changing the time zone. Yeah, that is the irony and uh, this is a more to the east of Bangladesh. Not changing the time zone is was pure insensitivity and arrogance or anything else? I do not know if you can think of a stronger word than that, it is probably that. <laughs> Hello. Uh, uh, sir, uh, hey, uh, thank you for the yeah. wonderful thoughts. Uh, I have one question. Uh, do you feel that issue of identity is more linked to the economic aspirations? And uh, how does it, uh, like, a uh, lot of talks are going on more of a geopolitical issues, like lot, lot many think tanks are actually working on, ge majorly on geopolitical issues, like Brookings or Aspen. But how about most of the works are being carried out by economic think tanks? That is influencing more of our identity crisis. See, I, I, I think um, that is, I think a lot of the problems are uh, triggered off by economic factors. I mean, see the differences, uh, you know, I feel um, when there is plenty, when there is uh, uh, enough room uh, in terms of economic room for all and there is growth happening and there are jobs, livelihoods being created, the uh, the Pavlovian kind of stresses are much less, you know, and you find people get on with their lives because they want to get a job, they want to do this, they want to do that. When that space shrinks, then what happens is something, uh, you know, some sort of uh, 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 Pavlovian factors start working and then you start looking for some external uh, source on which to hang your problems. And usually, of course, nobody will, hang, will say that I am in any way responsible for my problem. I have to find somebody else who is responsible for it. And here, identity becomes a very handy kind of a thing. So, in, in fact, in, my, in this earlier, in the discussion which I had with the, the uh, students from Manipur and Nagaland earlier, and it became a, I mean, they were getting pretty heated about it. I finally tried to tell them that uh, I still believe that the, you know, for instance, migration, they said that, you know, it has no economic basis and it was political, uh, political uh, or expediency and the unscrupulous political people who brought in people of a certain, uh, you know, community in to change the equations, etc. But I said, see, I can understand an unscrupulous politician doing that. But why would that person migrate unless he had something to gain? If supposing that person was quite happy where he or she was, just because a politician wanted you to migrate and offered you 100 rupees, you are not going to migrate, isn't it? Or 1000 rupees, you are not going to leave your home. So, wh why is a migrant so ready, why is a person so ready to migrate? Because he or she feels that the economic room, economic space in that place where they are is shrinking, is non-existent or whatever and that they have a chance of a better life if they go somewhere else. So, it is both, there is a push element and there is a pull element, both are at work. So, actually that is, uh, you know, it is a great thing which has happened. So, in the sense that uh, people, they are smart, they speak English, they, they are very good in certain things like call centers, hospitality business, in most of the malls and hotels and restaurants you go, the smart people you see, the men and young men and women are mostly people from Manipur, Nagaland and all that. That is good. The problem is, there are no livelihoods being created in Nagaland, in Manipur, etc. So, I mean, it is like, you know, some, uh, I, I remember this uh, kind of misplaced thing in Kerala many years ago, people were saying, yeah, let us train all these young girls and all to become nurses and we will export manpower, you know. So, that became, people actually started thinking that was a great uh, economics new strategy which nobody else could think of, that is you train people to get jobs elsewhere instead of trying to give them jobs there, you know. So, I, I think, you know, just, if we just think of what will happen to a state or a region 
where the most talented young people all leave that place. I think we don't have to, you know, we don't have to think too much to imagine the damage which it will do to that place. We need to find livelihoods and jobs and opportunities for them there. So that, that's one point. Second point is, people from the northeast have come down in large numbers because I'm I'm told that in Bangalore the number of people from the northeast working in Bangalore run into about 200,000 altogether from all the states of the northeast. And that, you know, it will be a large number even in place like here in national capital region, it will be probably even higher. The problem is, so that means a large number of people are now coming. In my time, when in the 70s and 80s and all, there were very few from the northeast who were traveling around. So that sense, they have come to mainland India. They are seeing all the opportunities. They are sending money back home. That's good. But there is no reverse movement of, not for jobs or even at least for tourism or anything because those are fantastically beautiful places and uh, okay so the apprehension is those are disturbed areas so why would uh, people go there as tourists for the same reason why people don't go to you know kashmir uh, nowadays so uh, i think one way to break out of that would be to you know somebody has to take the first step and if we wait for government to do the sensible thing we may be waiting for a very long time so instead of that Supposing we say that, you know, the uh, school and college students during vacation, they go on excursions, isn't it? In a, it's a practice. And usually they will all go to, from the south, they go to Kulu Manali, Valley of Flowers, or some place like that. So instead of that, supposing they decide to go to, uh, you know, Kohima or to Imphal and places like that, I think you will find a, a, a kind of, Young people from, you know, people to people contacts and especially among young people, if that starts happening, I think there will be definitely bridges will be built and there will be greater understanding. Yes, ma'am. told myself I am an Indian and I am moving around in my own country and I didn't have anything. I had a, an English friend with me who had his passport. So because he had his passport, we were able to get accommodation in hotels there. But realized that I was an outsider in my own country in Meghalaya. But he, he suggested, let us go to the police and ask them to give a letter. So the Meghalaya police were incredibly kind. They gave me a letter and duplicate saying that this is a senior citizen and she's, I, they had my address and all that. So that made it possible for me to move around. Otherwise, hotels were most difficult in that place. Otherwise, moving around, people were friendly, but not the hotel people. So, what was exactly the reason do you think for that? Specifically about Meghalaya, I cannot uh, comment, but I, I have a feeling part of this is because of the fact that there is uh, uh, intense attention from the intelligence services of the country on uh, people who travel to the northeast. Uh, all this is the people. So, there is, I think, probably for the uh, for right reasons or whatever, they are very concerned about that. Number two, one fact about the Northeast which many people may not know is that is one part of India where you as an Indian citizen need a visa to go to some parts. It's called a inner line permit. If you don't have, you may have, you may be an Indian national, you may have an Indian passport, you still need a visa <laughs> to go to some parts of the Northeast. Now, because these are antediluvian things, these are things which I don't think people are asking today the question, why are we having these things, you know? Somebody decided some long time ago to have it for some reason. Are those reasons still valid? Can this, can we, uh, you know, junk all these things and uh, open up the place? What would happen if we do that? Uh, so I think these are questions like this. You are absolutely right. So those are also hurdles in the in the way of people from the rest of the country traveling in the northeast. Yeah, uh, uh, Mike. That's right. That's yeah, I have a question. Yeah, any government document is acceptable. But you need a 
Yeah. yeah, your your narration about Northeast and particularly about Manipur has, I am sure, must have kindled the curiosity here of all the audience. I think they will look for more of Northeast stories, etc. Uh, I, for one, feel that the title of today's talk, the idea and identity of India, I think you have mentioned India, can we not think in solution in terms of that title? See, you mentioned about that Manipur. There are sub identities also, yeah. and which are at, you see, they are working to say against each other. Yeah. Why can't we gravitate all these sub identities towards a common identity? And there, I feel that the the work of the education, the education, how what sort of a syllabi or curricula is being taught in the schools, what what type of uh, say importance is being given in that sort of curricula. To India and not, not not ignoring the local things, so you one has to do something about the education because unless we build the education system right from the say primary to the at least class twelfth, the young generation will be probably deprived of you see gravitating towards the one India concept. I think I can. Uh, so I, I I think slightly differently on that subject because I feel there are many forces at work which are leading towards the emergence of a pan-Indian identity. I think Pawan Verma has written very uh, eloquently about it in his books, Being Indian and Becoming Indian, mm -hmm. where he talks about an emerging pan-Indian identity. For instance, girls and young women in uh, Kerala, in my state, they all wear uh, churidars and, you know, salwar kameez and things like that. Now, it's a standard. It's become like a uniform there. And uh, for them also, it's not uh, Mammooti and Mohan Lal who are their favorite actors. It is Salman Khan and uh, uh, Amir Khan and all these. So there is a kind of, and even uh, the favorite uh, cuisine is uh, tandoori chicken and whatever. So Pawan Verma writes about this. What I'm, I mean, I, I'm try, uh, even though I'm, I'm writing it, saying it jocularly, it's a very, he seriously talks about an emerging pan-Indian identity, which is being driven by the forces of, you know, postmodernism or, the consumer age and, and the economic affluence and prosperity, the growth of the middle class, all this is driving certain changes which are like irreversible changes and which are not again being uh, uh, deliberately created by any, any forces. This is happening. This is part of the process which is happening. I think in, the, in our education system, for instance, there is, um, uh, you know, in terms of what I remember from the uh, the textbooks, etc., of the even the primary and secondary, uh, you know, uh, classes. There is uh, the the idea of India, etc., gets a lot of, um, uh, you know, mention. I am actually more concerned about another thing. Interestingly, with this emerging pan-Indian identity, are we in danger of losing this amazing diversity? You know, for instance, for instance, um, many of the vernaculars. When many of the regional languages, I mean, people who speak Tamil and Telugu and Malayalam would not like these languages to be described as regional languages because these are very ancient languages. No, my, the, my, my point was exactly the same thing, what yeah. you are saying, that with, give the due importance of the local languages, etc. You cannot overlook them, but from that you come to the next level of pan-India. I am all for that. Because unless you educate the people in their local language and give due importance to the, you see, what is the local history, etc. For one, one example, like you say, the central school, you have a, all in the syllabus is throughout the common. I am not very sure how much importance has been given in that central school syllabus of, to the North East. Yeah. No, the, uh, yeah. That is the point which I, so, so, so my point is that give due importance in this pan-India culture to the local things also. That's you're absolutely right. And I think, for instance, um, in um, um, the regional identities definitely do not find enough importance in the school curricula. That's a fact. And uh, that should be right. Uh, I have a question which is a slight digression from the main uh, discussion. I, want to draw, I wanted to draw out your own views on the current state of bureaucracy. I'm reminded of what N. Vittal, the former CVC, said about uh, the so-called law of bureaucracy in India. He said, those who work in India get more work. Those who do not work get pay perks and promotion. That's the unfortunate uh, state. 
I think there are two reasons why uh, we are uh, encountering a lot of malaise in the uh, in the civil service system. One is the inability of the system to uh, punish errant officers. The other side of the spectrum is our gross inability to ring fence the good officers. We have seen in the case of Durga Shikhtin Akpal, recently in the case of uh, in the case of uh, Keshav Desarajudi, the former health secretary. Uh, the, the question I have is, sir, has the time come for us to do a complete a paradigm? change in bureaucracy by introducing an element of lateral movement from the private sector or from a policy specialists to get yeah. into bureaucracy and uh, ensure some more transparency and less uh, uh, pliant behavior is uh, demonstrated here. Very good question. Um, I think uh, first, you know, a couple of points which I want to say is I have been now part of the private sector for 25 years. I am not a great admirer of the private sector, frankly. I find what passes for uh, all the alleged great qualities of the private sector are mostly lack of systems, ad hocism, and the freedom to do what you want. Now, the government system, when it works, and it works a lot of the time, only thing is what I am saying is it never is projected when it works. Something which it works is never projected, is system driven and process driven. Now, these are two terms which you will hear in all private sector quality management system, management improvement systems, management programs. That is what government is all about, it was always like that. Now, the point is when those systems become ends in themselves, there are and places where the system fails, definitely it fails. I, I again, I, you know, I am not refuting your basic point. I think uh, there are many examples of good, uh, uh, good administrators and there are many examples of poor administrators. There are examples of bad people going unpunished, etc. Now, I think the important point is what you mentioned is have we come to a time where we need an administrative overhaul? We definitely have come. The second uh, administrative reform commission is going on and I do not know how many years it has taken and whether its, whether its recommendations will ever be implemented is another point. The British system on which our system is based has already undergone some four or five major overhauls and they are you know always keeping, in, uh, keeping pace with the, the world as things are. So, we are grossly, we are way past the time when we need an overhaul. For example, we have antediluvian things like uh, lower division clerk, grade 4. Now, in today's time and age, in today's technology, what do you need all these uh, grades for? So, I think I would say that we need to do a fundamental revision of all this, find out how much, what all we can outsource and what we can do away with. And we need to do it. It cannot be done at one fell swoop. It will have to be done. But we need to start the process. Second thing is we need to, in that revised administrative structure, we need to uh, configure uh, the pay package in such a way that the best talent is to government. See, I can only feel sorry for any society which does not attract its best talent into government. The Singapore government, recognizing that, ensures that the pay of the top, the key bureaucrats is indexed to the highest pay which is paid anywhere in the island republic. It is indexed to their highest pay of whether it is the financial services, institutions, etc. So, they understand that very well. So, I, I, you know, I feel for instance in my batch, in 77 batch and around that time, two thirds of on an average, two thirds of the intake into the IAS and IFS every year were gold medalists from their respective universities. Unfortunately, I do not think that is the case today. The brightest are not coming into government service today. And uh, so, that would be a very, uh, it would it would be a very dangerous thing for the country because the role of the government cannot be underestimated in any, in any society, least of all in a society where 70 percent of the population. Uh, by any definition of the term are poor and cannot even access modern healthcare facilities. In such a society, you need a very strong government. And I, so, I feel that, that I fully agree with you, the time for administrative reform is well past. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, I have a, an observation and a question. I am from Kerala. I was back home last week and uh, it was very funny to see my uncle who is a horticulturist takes up landscape projects from Cochin to Palakkad based in Trishur. All his, all his uh, labors are from Assam. It was really funny to see the, his supervisor 
deal with them he 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 said full sentences in malayalam and ended with a ha and a ha and a tha that was all the communication that was it was really funny to see work going on so you know just to uh, support your point that yes I, it was really amazing for me to see such a large labor force from the northeast in kerala um my question i am an alumnus of the university of hyderabad and i'm sure there are several others i see a faculty member here in 1996 when i joined the university there were two people from the entire northeast in the university today i'm sure there are more than a thousand um but one thing that uh, was constantly voiced in in the community uh, which is non northeast was that they never recognized the differences between a kuki a mete a garu a khasi and others for them they were all northeast the community itself uh, never attempted to integrate itself or i you know i don't really want to use the word integrate because you you respect diversity i do too but to make the nature of northeast and the identity and the differences among that identity it did not make an attempt to let people who are not from that region west of kolkata know about these differences so uh, you know there were misconceptions that continued that these are dog eaters and others you know all all, all kinds of disparaging things how how do you think people from the north east do they really take this as an issue amongst uh, the region that they should explain themselves better to people from the rest of the country i feel you know i uh, i feel that if you, if you uh, read about what actually happening in the north east and the many of the conditions from the villages and towns from where many of these young people come and uh, they are not they are not probably voicing it or expressing it but there is very very deep sense of uh, and it's not just uh, you know it's not a superficial kind of thing what are really going on in many of those places is uh, i mean it's very difficult for us here let me put it that way to really imagine what they're going through so i think it is uh, the onus is on us to reach out to them and uh, how we can do that is uh, it depends and sometimes as societies you know in some places some societies are more welcoming some societies are less welcoming etc so i i don't know about you know how that happens but i feel the onus is on uh, on the mainland uh, mainlanders to really reach out for to these people and create engagements and opportunities to understand each other better i have an observation sir uh, we were looking for a pan indian identity actually subtly we are our pan indian identity is a punjabi identity uh all over the country we wear what we used to say in school punjabi dress so it's salwar kameez uh paneer butter masala has been declared as a national food uh it is a it is a part of every menu in every function all over south india or wherever in the country is uh our marriages are now subtly changing it is mainly it is the sangeet or whatever it is it is completely punjabi the one thing which is unifying the entire country is a mobile phone the largest mobile phone company is a punjabi company and finally we have been ruled by a punjabi for the past 10 years namaste <laughs> 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 sir sir uh, with the elections around corner uh, i just observed that in assam and tripura the voting poll was around uh, 80% plus or 85% plus where in a place poor connectivity is supposed to be be a big hurdle for the elections and all but in the south india or in the north india why do we see that only 65% or you know hardly 70% being polled with this i actually have two questions that is it that larger participation of the people in the north is conveys any specific meaning with that or uh, anything else is the reason for that i mean i think you know uh, uh, this i'm just giving a kind of a semi uh, uh kind of a jocular response to your statement is that it's very similar to the difference in voting percentage between india and the united states you know in the united states i don't know what the voting percentage is but it's below 50% and um, uh, and in india it is still around 65% on an average throughout the country so the northeast i think this it, uh, you know there is still a, a basic belief that through the political process they can Uh, they're looking for a way to better themselves they haven't they've have not yet become cynical about uh, the political process i think 
that could be the explanation why they uh, they are there's nothing more sinister than that i think it is a genuine feeling that um, they feel that through the political process they can better express their uh, needs wants and also improve their lot that's what i believe you have to take a last question yeah um uh, so i'm just finding it interesting that uh, you know the topic was you know uh, india but we have been spending more i think more than three quarters of the time only talking about northeast now you what about the concept of you know pan india identity i want to change it a little bit and say that you know pan national identity let's say across the nation now when i look think of that there is a ambiguity that i see you know if you look at our indian uh, the passport that we carry in english it says indian passport in hindi it's written as bharatiya passport right i think we have a national identity crisis which is that here i think the people sitting here we are all very comfortable in english speaking in english communicating english reading english books lot of lot of us wear jeans all these things now you have mentioned about uh, you know shadis etc and there is a hindustani identity where we believe that there is some inherent benefit in you know speaking hindi adopting to certain cultures like as if people brought out in you know, a punjabi or type of clothing and food etc and then the third one which is the bharati identity which is you know one political leader made a statement you know crimes happen in india and not in bharat right i think there is a conflict among all the in people living in this nation which one am i i think majority of us sitting here would be considering ourselves as indian we go to some parts of the land they consider and say i'm hindustani and people who want to retain their or, or, our original culture ethos etc who believe there were certain kind of values we have actually achieved a lot in the past etc they believe in an identity called bharati where the regionalism is prominent on top of it sits nationalism now how do we come to a conclusion of pan national identity when we can't figure out which one will be applies to us i think the uh, point is that this ambivalence is in intrinsic there and i don't think we can we will we should try for a resolution of this uh, problem uh, or we will achieve a resolution of the problem and i think this is what nasim talib meant when he talks about this anti fragility that a very sharply delineated definition of what it who is indian and what is it means to be indian is probably going to be very troubling because then we will run into all kinds of issues and this ambivalence which is there about who is indian or bharat or hindustan i think that should remain because that in and which is why india constantly tests the meaning of the definition of the term nation itself isn't it that's why it it, it is alternatively referred to as subcontinent nation subcontinent no other part of the world is referred to as a subcontinent though there are geographical land masses which are bigger than india so i think this ambivalence in my opinion is part of uh, uh, the identity of india the idea of india, idea, of india. Idea of india.